teach an old dog new tricks. Hi, I'm Gail Rubenstein, the founder and CEO of Retail Resilient. We teach car dealers all over the country how to sell more cars and make more money using social media platforms. Like I said, who says you can't teach an old dog new tricks? Check us out at retailresilient.com or send us a message in the chat bar on the Auto Hub Show. Hi, it's Barry here with White Glove Performance Group. Thanks for joining the show this morning. Always great content on here and a big shout out to Ian and Jeff for all the hard work that they put into this show. For White Glove Performance Group, what do we do? We have a cloud-based styling technology called Touchpoint. Um, Touchpoint is used in dealerships all across North America. Uh, and the main reason that for its popularity is because dealerships can now amp up their team to be calling 50 people an hour. Um, they can leave a personalized voicemail, a custom email, as follow-up, all with a click of a mouse. This really speeds up some of the jobs that happen in the dealership, such as cleaning up your recalls, um, cleaning up lost souls in service, running a private sale, trying to reach out to your database to buy inventory. Uh, obviously, we know that's the way to source it in today's environment. Um, so yeah, whitegloveperformancegroup.com. My direct is 587-899-6600. Love to have a chat with you about some of the things that we can do. Everyone, I'm John Latka from Automotive Business Solutions, where we help dealerships build more productive and proactive buy appointment sales cultures through our performance management partnership program. So if you want to increase your sales volume by two to three sales per month per salesperson, call our toll-free number 877-708-8484 for a free consultation. Thank you very much. So good morning, everybody, and welcome, and thanks for coming on. Uh, first of all, as always, we want to thank our sponsors. Gail is on the call. John's on the call. So is Barry. So thanks very much. Uh, and uh, we're going to get into the show. So first of all... A couple books. So if you're not familiar with Zig Ziglar, he's unfortunately no longer with us. Great historic book, A Zig Ziglar Selling 101. Uh, another really good book that I've read personally, which I recommend, called Gary Vanderchuk's Jab, 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 Right Hook. If you're not familiar with Gary, he's a legend in advertising and social media and one of my personal idols uh, just because he's so blatantly honest and does it in such a way that is entertaining. Uh, the Generation Myth by Bob Duffy, and as I've put on the uh, uh, show before, uh, Surrounded by Idiots, about the disc profile. So if you really f want to learn more about generations, how to deal with them, that's a great book as well. Uh, and if you need the link to that video from today, let me know. It's about 15 minutes, it's TEDx, and it's got a lot of great information on what generations are, but more importantly, how they think, and what created them, which was interesting to me because... I never really thought about that before, like why they are who they are. Uh, go ahead, Jeff. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, for joining us here. Um, if those of you who watch the video, I'm I'm looking up to the left to uh, to kind of come up with a solution or something. Um, because uh, if I look to the right, then I can't make mistakes. But uh, <laughs> thank you for joining us. Uh, we always have a little bit of a disclaimer that basically says uh, the views and opinions expressed on this show are those of our guests, not necessarily of us. And uh, if you want to read our uh, disclaimer further in detail, please go on to uh, autohubshow.com. Disclaimer. And the show today is The Generation Show. So we have representatives from multiple generations. Uh, as you may not be aware of, I think uh, Generation Millennial is about 40 plus percent of the current working populace. That's soon to be outpaced by Gen Z. So even though the millennials feel that they're in charge right now, that's about to shift. So it'll certainly be interesting to see how that uh, changes things. So I'm just going to move this over uh, a second here. So to continue on while Ian's doing the tech stuff, um, we do have some great guests here. But first of all, I'd like to just share our mission statement with you. And that's basically the Auto Hub Show. Our whole point is to bring to dealers some great new information from people and connect people from all over. And we're proud to say that we've connected uh, people from uh, little places, uh, Northern uh, Canada to as far away as uh, the Georgia, the country. I always like that to say that the Americans go, what's so big deal about Georgia? Sorry, Keith, I'm not trying to make fun of your accent, but um, that's what we're here for, for dealers to do better. And joining us today, we have a great group of guests and today's show is the generation show. 
And it was very interesting with that lead in what this lady had to say is how everybody does everything. And I read something the other day that says the millennial generation is very interesting because the early millennials were the last people to play outside until dark and the first people to, to work a smartphone. So very interesting. They know both. And I can see the millennials here on the on the call are kind of going, mm, yes. But uh, joining us today, first of all, we have Marco Matanudo from Mercedes-Benz Toronto. He is a uh, Gen Zer. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, and uh, certainly a social media personality. And we haven't seen him for a while because of the his former employers uh, or ownership's rules of uh, of interaction. But Marco, please say hi and thanks for joining us again. Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't mean it literally, but thank you very much. Uh, next, <laughs> next, we have uh, Super Sue Finneron from, uh, I'm not sure if you're Comox, Courtney, uh, Campbell River, I don't know. Where are you from? How about Vancouver Island? Most, most Vancouver. people know where that is, I hope. <laughs> that's like saying that's like saying Canada from, to people from New York. But Sue is a faculty member of the Automotive Business School of Canada. She's a former uh, Hyundai dealer. And I think you guys had something else before that, didn't you? Yeah, General Motors. <laughs> there you go. So went from, went from one massive thing to a second massive one. Sue, say hi. Tell us a little bit about yourself, please. Uh, great to be here. I'm a former PhD, of course. Papa has a dealership. Uh, and um, just uh, thrilled to be asked to join because the future, I think, of our business is super exciting with the people that are up and coming. So glad to be here. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next, we have a gentleman new to the show who is actually joining us uh, from work. And um, he's actually not going uh, on video, so everybody there doesn't know he's joining us. No, he's also watching for ups. But it's Keith McKenzie from Jenkins Subaru Hyundai in uh, Bridgeport, West Virginia. Keith, thanks for joining us, and tell us a bit about yourself. Greetings and salutations from wild and wonderful West Virginia. Uh, I work with uh, Jenkins Subaru Hyundai, located in Bridgeport, West Virginia. Uh, kind of a small market. However, we absolutely rule our zone. Um, we're one of the top ranked dealerships in the DC zone. So keep on rocking. Rock well, perfect. I have to say that you couldn't have a, a better dual uh, franchise operation because I can't see Hyundai buyers buying Subarus and I can't see Subaru buyers buying Hyundai, but although I have to <laughs> So uh, again, thank you again for the generation show. And Ian, take it away. Yeah, um, is the process being used? Is it the process being used? The generation of the person that really matters in order to succeed in today's market. Uh, let's start with Keith. Well, I, I think it all comes down to your clientele and who you're going after, uh, as far or, you know who, who you're trying to um, to sell and what you're trying to sell. Um, I use, I, I'm, I'm at the age where I was trained by the OGs. However, I still embrace technology. So um, I use an app called QuickPage, which is extremely useful. I'm able to communicate via video, via pictures. Um, and then I also communicate uh, via social media through Facebook and Instagram as well. But it's unique being in West Virginia because we're kind of behind the times as far as technology goes, roughly, you know, maybe five to 10 years or so. So not all of my clientele embraces technology. So it really just depends on who you're going after and who your audience is. So, so the old pages still exist in that area? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Hey, um, there's been times where, you know, if you're making cold calls, you just open up the telephone book and go at it. However, um, since I've started using social media, especially down here, it, it's not really being taken advantage of. And I'm the only person in the market that that I see doing it constantly, day in, day out. And that's what I attribute my success to. I'm from Pennsylvania. I'm not from here. I don't know anybody. I, you know, I'm not one of the high school guys. But I'm a household name down here because of Facebook and because of Instagram. So you're not the high school athlete who, who moved into the uh, car business? No, definitely not. Um, I'm prior military. 
Oh, okay. Um, Thanks for your service. Yeah, so, yeah, thank you. Um, and ended up getting out of the Navy, and I got a job opportunity down here in West Virginia, so I took it, and I've accelerated. Fantastic. Well done. Uh, Marco, you're muted still. It's nice you to think see that somebody, somebody uh, younger than a, than a boomer going like this, going, where's that mute button? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I believe that uh, the technology is here to help, and I mean that we should we should use it as our um, we should use it our, as much as we can. It's not just technology, though. It's it's anything that's that's pushed our our industry forward and communicating with our clients. I mean, it's uh, uh, it's certainly made it easier. I mean, I see the generational disconnect with my parents. Um, you know, they're they're a bit afraid of technology. They're also intrigued by it. Uh, and they they love it. Um, I mean, you know, except when their internet goes down and they call me right away. But uh, ultimately, they 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 love it. They love the fact that they can talk to my um, to my sister that lives in Los Angeles, uh, previously Tokyo, all over the world, and uh, and see their their grandkid through COVID and everything else. And uh, I think that they're happy to see it, and um, and they use it to their own advantage. And I mean, they're not trying to sell anything, so why wouldn't we use it to our advantage? And, and gain more traction uh, for our sales and everything else, right, that we do, uh, even service. Like, I mean, uh, think about the, the, the trust uh, that's built when the service department sends you a video of your car. The technician takes a video of your car underneath. A lot of BMW stores are doing that now, and they show you exactly the tire uh, tread depth and everything else. Uh, it, it's, it's making us be more transparent, which I think any generation can appreciate that, right? So... And, and do you feel the, I know you were with, I think, Audi before Mercedes. Do you feel that Mercedes customers are any different from the Audi customer? Um, there, there, is a, there is a certain level of difference between the two, uh, the two clients. Um, but technology is, again, it's, it's welcomed by, by both of them regardless. It's, um, yeah, I mean, sending somebody a video of a, walk around video of a car that they're interested in. It, it, it makes it can make anybody happy whether they're, they're buying a honda a hyundai a toyota a mercedes a bugatti uh, uh, it doesn't matter and because we're not really doing it as much as an industry it's, it's pushed us forward during covid because we had to uh, but we were not doing it as much as an industry so people are not expecting it and anything that's a positive that's not expected is welcomed even more and, and builds trust and um it makes you seem transparent even quicker. So you're, it puts your intentions uh, forward um, ahead uh, pretty pretty quick, right? So appreciate that. Sue? So when it comes to process, I think, you know, it's, it's important to have a certain level of process, um, but we do need to be adaptable both in managing um, our employees because we have a whole range of people as well as our clientele. And it's not just a one step, one way anymore especially when it comes to clientele, we need to be flexible and working to what works for them, communicating um, in the way that they like to communicate. As we say, some people don't wanna get a text message to buy a car, whereas uh, you know, the younger generation, that's how they wanna buy. Um, whereas somebody like me, I'm probably more email um, based and like the video idea. Um, whereas a boomer wants to be there face to face, right? Um, so you need to be able to be adaptable and be able to handle every which way. And again, same with management. I was never a big process store. I had rules um, that you had to live by, but I didn't have a process that was set for every single sale. And I was uh, going back uh, a while back when we, we actually won um, the Hyundai uh, Canada Dealer of the Year uh, many moons ago. And I was looking at an interview that I did a couple months ago and I said, we are not a process store. So maybe I was ahead of my time, I don't know. Um, but because I had such a varied team, um, I had to, I worked with everybody in the way that worked best for them. Also, I was a smaller store, so I had the ability to do that. I think in a larger, more metro store, it's much more difficult. Um, but what you, you know, when you've only got a team of six uh, sales staff, it's pretty easy to be adaptable to what their needs are. But I think that to be successful in today's day and age, uh, unless your crew is all millennials or all Gen X, uh, you've got to work with everybody because we're all motivated by different things. And we need to be aware of that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, 
Thanks for that, Sue. Uh, Gail, maybe you had some thoughts, being that you train people of different generations to use technology. Maybe you had some thoughts on this question. Um, I found it interesting what everyone said, and I kind of agree with them. You have to adapt to what the customer needs. And everyone wants to communicate differently. And, and Sue was very kind of accurate about that in terms of, you know, some people prefer email, some people prefer text message, some people prefer to buy the old school way. Some people want to do, I don't know, my dad is 71 years old, but he's like, I would love to buy a car online and never talk to a car dealer ever again. So, you know, he is the older generation and he wants to purchase the way a millennial would purchase. So I think, you know, every employee, like kind of what Sue was saying, every employee is different and every customer is different, but having the option to find out how people want to be communicated with and then kind of adjust accordingly. Yeah. I mean, we, we do that with our customers also when we train them. Yeah, I mean, a buddy of mine's trying to buy a used convertible and he was trying to buy it from Manitoba and they actually sent still images of the undercarriage of the car from the shop. And I don't know if it's converted them, but it, it's it's interesting because there's so much, so many moving parts to get a, a car from a different part of the country to another part and not being able to go there is kind of interesting. So I think there's right and wrong ways to do that. But go ahead, Jeff. That's very true. You know, funny, Keith, uh, you mentioned the term OG. And um, <laughs> OG. You know, it's, uh, OG. It's, it's funny. Uh, I don't know anybody here that's over the age of uh, 40 has got to admit to have uh, to have Googled OG at least once. So <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, at first, I thought it was old, uh, old guard. And then, of course, uh, we learned what it really is, and uh, we're in the car business, so we don't want to use the real G. But uh, so tell me something, Marco. Should an OG, how should an OG manager deal differently with staff and or customers of the different generations? I know we've already talked about technology, and technology aside, how should somebody different, how should an OG manager deal with them? Um, it depends. Is this person technologically inclined? That's the, the first thing, right? Because if, you, if you're not technology inclined, then you should support the staff and uh, encourage them to, uh, to go online and, uh, and use technology to their advantage as much as possible, even though you might not understand it fully. Well, put it um, this but, way. Let's assume the person does not have tech support on, on uh, saved as a favorite or uh, their email or their te uh, messaging. Um, I think I still think you should be supportive of the staff and encourage them to do it, even uh, even though you don't understand it. It doesn't mean that uh, you can't um, help your staff uh, achieve it. I mean, there is uh, there is great uh, mentors out there and people that you can hire to teach it. And essentially, when I was managing, for example, whenever I hired somebody to train my staff, I would sit with my staff and uh, and see if I could learn something, too. Right. So maybe that's the best way to do it is to hire somebody that knows how to do it. And then sit through and try to understand it yourself. And even if you don't retain 100% of what's happening, uh, just getting 10, 20, 30% ahead of the game uh, and, and walking out of the room with, again, knowing a few things more than when you first walked into it, I think that's, that's invaluable, right? And at the same time, you're, you're supporting your staff and, uh, and, and getting them the right training because, uh, again... You know, my mom's a pastry chef. I wish I could. Uh, I, I wish I could bake as much as uh, as good as her. But uh, ultimately, when I am baking, I call her because she knows best, right? So, and I and I get her to walk me through the process and everything else. So, it, it's uh, it's just a hurdle ultimately. And uh, just like when they got in the industry, they had to learn some stuff that they uh, they didn't know. It's it's the same thing. Nothing has changed, right? So, so in other words, you're the. Uh... You're the living proof of the Alexa commercial where the uh, person calls their parent and uh, says, help me out, I burnt the turkey. <laughs> the, the one thing to support Marco there a little bit, if you don't mind real quick, is as much as we have built teams in the past, probably everybody on this call has, and you know, you look very closely at your demographic and, and you're balancing out, is there a... Uh, is there an Asian population where you are? Is there, you know, do you need those languages on your floor? I think it's the exact same thing with technology is you have to be able to say, I've got a guy for that. I got a girl for that. I got somebody who can get online and do every video out there, but I've also got somebody that can do a proper 
walk around for that person who wants that experience in the showrooms. I think when you're building your team, you got to look at that as another another dimension almost um, as to rounding out your team properly. Thanks, Barry. I appreciate that. It's funny, though, how we're all taking the position of generations as uh, quote unquote technology. And uh, is so, you know, uh, Keith, I'll ask you this. And uh, is technology the generations or is it what else is there? And again, should, how should managers deal with them on technologies or whatever? Well, I can, I can kind of say it from, from both perspectives. I've worked at a dealership that was not um, embraceive of technology at all whatsoever. Uh, they, they didn't like it. And it was get the client in here, get them in front of you, sitting down, go over the numbers, slow everything down and start the sales process. But I would notice that um, we were missing out just on a ton of clientele, out-of-state clientele, clientele just shopping. And needless to say, I ended up leaving that dealership um, and joined a, another dealership, the dealership I'm at now presently that embraces technology. Um, they 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 educate the client so we have we deal with a lot of the um the older heads for lack of a better term so uh the older generation and a lot of the technology that's in these vehicles you're, you're having clients that are going from a 2019 or, or from a 2009 which had you know, electronic stability control and cruise control. Now you're going to lane keeping assist, adaptive cruise control, braking assist, and they're just their their minds are blown. So you oh, really God. have are you to. Telling me that you got inventory to sell? I, I do. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we're actually. I mean, it, the the thing that we've started to do is we're selling out of our pipeline. You know, that's the only thing that that we're able to do. I mean, we, we have nothing that's tangible. You know, we, we have some pre-owned inventory on our lot, but most of the inventory that's coming in, it's already spoken for. And this is what I can tell you, um, just based on what I'm seeing, as far as inventory goes, if you're not adapting and you're not trying to capture every single person and convert that into a cell, you're going to be going out of business. You're going to be going bankrupt very quickly. And you can just see it from the inventory standpoint around here. Um, you know, a lot of pre-owned vehicles, but ladies and gentlemen, that bubble has popped. The pre-owned bubble is popped and it's going down. Um, so if you're not capturing new clientele, selling new vehicles, and then replenishing with used vehicles, it's, you're you're going to be grinding to a halt. It's just it's not going to happen for you if you don't embrace the technology and move forward. Great point. Thank you very much. Uh, I have to recognize Troy's comments uh, about the different generations of technology, and he put in there. Uh, he says that his mother and father-in-law, his mom and father-in-law, live on their uh, on their iPads and uh, et cetera, et cetera, and get on Facebook. My mother-in-law, who's in her 80s, has arguments with my kids about uh, setting up tech, uh, on settings and everything else. So that's very true. Uh, interestingly enough, she's not just on Facebook, but she's on Instagram because the, the millennials, the Gen Zs are like, ah, Facebook's for old people. And uh, <laughs> Sue, what's your position on, uh, on, on how they should deal with the different generations? And is it technology only? You know what? It's not just technology. I know most of us have spoken about that, but I was just on holiday with my dad on a golf holiday uh, for a couple of weeks. And uh, I spent a lot of time with him in a golf cart. So we had some good conversations and we were talking about um, how the business was when he started uh, back in, uh, gosh, 1968, 69 in Canada. And, uh, you know, just the morals of the managers. Well, basically they had none. Uh, he even said one of his managers, and I thought this was an urban myth, would actually throw the keys on the roof and wouldn't let the customer go. He goes, no, he actually did it. And I went, no way. <laughs> yeah. 
But, you know, as you, uh, Marco, I think, said, you know, we've become more, or Keith, uh, we've become more transparent. And I think that that's a great thing. You know, we've got better morals. I think the people coming up underneath us even think more about the world than, than we ever did. You know, um, those Gen Zers, man, they're going to save the world for us, right? And we, as we all grow and as we age, we know better. Are the generations behind us, they know better, they do better. Um, you know, now we're talking about uh, inclusivity, we're talking about diversity, uh, you know, in all those different things. And that's something that we never talked about probably even 10 years ago in our business. Um, but we talk about it now. So yes, in that way, we are changing. And I think that the, or the older guard need to be very, very aware of all of those things when they're working with their new people. And as Barry said, when you're hiring your team, um, we have to look at all of the people that we're dealing with, who we have in our community, and make sure that uh, it matches, that our team matches with our clientele. Yeah, that's a tre tremendous point. And uh, that's very true. And, you know, it's funny because uh, Keith mentioned where he is, is the fact that uh, the people around him, you know, are, are back about 10 years on technology. However, he's thriving through technology. So we have to adapt to the people we deal with. Ian. Yeah. Um, 40 under 40, top 40, 50, 60. Does age really matter? I mean, I see these all the time and online it's like oh you know best under 40 or best under 50 or best under 30 and i and, and I, I really question it because i had the opportunity now a couple years ago to train a car salesman who was working part-time three days a week at 84 uh he he was still out selling some of the guys you work with working part-time and i asked him i said well why are you still doing this he says i need to be interested he says i've been doing this for over 50 years at the time and he says, you know, the business has changed, sure, but it's really still about people. And I think it's interesting uh, from a generation's point of view that there's differences in generations, but it's easy to generalize. I think there's a lot of similarities that we don't uh, realize. But who, who of, of anyone here has received top 40 under 40? I mean, uh, let's start with someone who's under 40. Um, I don't know, Marco, have you received an award for that? You're still muted. So no, I just, <laughs> have I received received an award for that? No, I haven't. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't know. It's just that even if there was an award for top forty under under forty, I mean, it's uh, it's not an award I would be uh, I would be chasing after. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, I, I, I it's. <sighs> you know the generational disconnect i think ultimately we're still we're still people and uh and the generation uh, the way we were brought up uh, we don't i don't try to connect with my clients based on their age i try to connect based on their personality which makes it a lot easier uh having said that though my first management job i'll never forget the uh my uh, my manager pulled me my gym pulled me into his office and he said that guy is you know 56 years old you can't talk to him the same way you talk to somebody who's 25 or 30 and uh and kind of uh set me opened up my eyes quite a bit more so I'm, i am aware of that but actively i do not uh i don't i don't seek those awards i know my wife does uh <laughs> but no i've never received one um yeah i just i don't know it's just something that uh that i never considered fantastic gail did you receive one um, no, I've never received a top 40 under 40. However, I won a lot of awards in my life for performance, just not that one. Okay. You didn't get that trophy? Nope. Didn't get that trophy, but I'm pretty proud of myself. <laughs> I do have to stick my nose in on this comment because, uh, my good friend Ian there, he's, uh, he's a bit of a conspiracy theorist. And, um, we, we always discuss about what, um, what do they use to make these decisions? Top 40, under 40 or whatever, best company to work for and all that other stuff. And it's uh, sometimes uh, I won't say what Ian's answers are because uh, that will get me in trouble on our disclaimer, but uh, it is very interesting what they use for parameters on that. Yeah, I was wondering where they come up with their parameters. I don't even know what they are, to be honest. Well, there's a gentleman who owns a, a payment company out of Washington State, and he got in the news recently, a couple of years ago,
by agreeing to pay a base salary of all his employees of 70000 or more. And he took a big pay cut to do that. And everyone said he was crazy and he was a socialist and all this stuff. And he comments on a lot of this stuff all the time. But he has the highest retention of employees in his market. And he has about 10 to 50 applicants for every role. But he's got a really interesting view on this because uh, one of these magazines contacted him and wanted him to participate in this award. And then they want him to pay a lot of money. <laughs> he's like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pass. I'm going to hard pass on that. And then he, then he publicized this online that they were doing this. It was kind of interesting. Keith, any thoughts? Uh, just before you go there, pretty special on that comment. And the interesting thing that people do have to remember, if they start treating people properly, customers, staff, pay, everything else, things go up. And this guy's company stock value doubled after that. And I had a comment on this. Go ahead, Troy. Well, you know, as far as the generational thing is concerned and the age part, um, when I was in, oh, back in the olden days in the hotel business, I was in my 20s. My general manager was in his mid-40s, and we were golfing with his buddy who was in his 60s. And I just asked my general manager, I'm like, I just work in the hotel, but why are you hanging out with me? And he said, there's a real value in having friends in every age group and every generation. You learn from the people who've lived through stuff you're about to live through. You learn from people coming up. Everyone's got a great viewpoint. And it doesn't matter about politics or geography or, you know, your, your ethnicity. It's all about being open to some of these experiences. And the age part's important, too. And since then, I now have friends who are in their 20s and friends that are in their 60s. And I have great conversations with both of them. And I've learned a ton from it. And I think that there's some real value in crossing that generation gap in your social life, too. Thanks for that. Keith, you have any thoughts on the 40 awards? Um, so I, I have not won um, 40 under 40, but um, I've won numerous sales awards. As far as winning the award, um, I mean, I think it would be great, but, um, you know, as far as the company wanting me to pay money for the award or anything like that, realistically, um, you know, I, the awards that I win are, you know, through local newspapers, different things like that, and they want you to pay to advertise through them. But realistically, you know, I, I do my own advertising through Facebook. Um, you know, I sell my vehicles, I do my own marketing, I, I do everything. So for me to, to try and push for an award, it, it takes away from my sales. So I, I'm not going to divert that energy away just to try to win an award just for bragging rights. However, if I do get it, I'm going to brag away. <laughs> and I have a question, Keith, do you have any of those wrestling belts? <laughs> Wrestling belts, unfortunately. <laughs> Sue, any thoughts on the 40 under 40 or the 50 under 50 or the 70 well, under 75 award or whatever award they're doing these I'm, days? I'm too, I'm too old uh, to have won a 40 under 40 because I was already over 40 when they started uh, it. We thought you were 25. Uh, and, I, and, you know, kind of, and I'm just going to take a real quick hit at millennials. You know, they needed a ribbon for everything. And that's when 40 under 40 started, right? <laughs> I had to do it. I'm sorry, you guys. Uh, you know what? As you say, is it an advertising, you know, a, a guys to sell advertising? Who knows? Um, for me, just be the best you can be every day in everything you do. And that that's what matters to me. And, you know, it's having those great relationships with um, my students now, uh, my team, who I, I still stay in contact with, even though we've now been gone for four years almost. Um, and my customers even, they still call me, you know, I haven't advertised on the radio in four years and I still go to the grocery store and hear, hey, Super Sue, you know, that means more to me. <laughs> and, and having a student ask me my opinion in something that's a major life event for them, that means so much to me, more to me than any award that I could ever receive. So, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, we just... Uh... Glenn, uh, Troy and I were just talking that uh, one of the larger groups in Western Canada, one of the owners is just up for the Order of Canada, which is a national award. And it was kind of interesting because I tried to buy a, a, a car from his group last year and they made a little bit of a financial error in the calculations to the point where I didn't uh, buy the vehicle. 
But more importantly, I called him personally and, and said, hey, you might want to be aware of this. And he was like, ah, it's okay. We sold it to somebody else. So that just go, give, goes to show you that, uh, you know, the award isn't always justified. But I wonder what that costs. Order of Canada. I don't know. And then, well, the Order of Canada may not cost, but uh, it's, it's, they, they, they look at all this other stuff. But it's very interesting, you know, I don't know if it's the same group or not, but they, they, have, they have won for 15 years straight the 100 best employers to work for in the country. And they bought out a group, of, a group, a smaller group of dealers, a dealership group locally. And the first thing they did was clean house. <laughs> exactly. So it's because, yep, we're so good that we want our own people to be there. <laughs> so there you go. Go ahead, Jeff. Um, so interesting, we, we, we had another gentleman that, that we had was uh, going to join us who was actually uh, just in his early 30s. And this was sort of directed toward, I wanted more of their, their opinion just because we've got really a full slate of people everywhere. But Sue, how positive are you for 2022? And be honest. Um, well, first off, I think, um, as you know, Marco said, most of the product that they have coming in is sold. So dealers still have a ton of um, pre-orders that are sold. So as far as new is concerned, as long as they can get those trades in, uh, I think it's going to be another decent year. People still have a lot of cash uh, pent up because they're still not going on holiday. They're still not going out for dinner. Um, you know, we're kind of right back where we were again a year ago uh, as far as um, freedoms, let's say. Um, so I, I think that this year will probably be still maybe not as good as last year, but I think still a strong year. And um, and then towards the end of the year, I kind of see it bouncing out a little bit <laughs> uh, because it can't go on forever. Uh, those of us that have been in the business for a long time, we know it goes up and then it goes down and up and down and, you know, this too yeah. shall pass, right? The good and the bad. <laughs> You know, I, I, I tend to agree with you. And it's very funny, uh, Marco, uh, I'll go to you next, but I want to get your opinion on this. Our local Mercedes dealers seem to have lots of inventory sitting on the ground to sell. Not like they used to have, but their showrooms are full and their, their, their lots, their displays are full. Is the same thing, is that the same thing with, with on your end? Is it a product thing or is it just the operator? It's definitely a product thing because... Thing, uh... Uh, yeah, we're we're <laughs> we have nothing here. So if you can tell them to send us some of those units, we're we're sold well into the middle of this year. Um, like there's some cars here waiting years. My own my own Mercedes, I ordered in February of last year, and I still haven't received it. Uh, and I work for the company, <laughs> so yeah, you wanted a uh, Designo. Come on. No, no, just white. <laughs> that's a plain white with black interior. Easy, well, that's easy. why. If you'd ordered <laughs> green with, with brown and Jerry, you'd have got it by now. So, so yeah, we have two yellow cars in the showroom right now. So <laughs> hey, I've got to tell you something. I saw an article last week that says the uh, the best color to have in inventory is yellow because there's a small amount of people that want it and very few people stock it. So I think you yep. should get online and make sure people ever across the country share it. And you never know what you're going to get. You might get somebody from Vancouver Island that wants a yellow whatever. Hey, it's and not Sue. Sorry. It's, come, on. <laughs> come on. I like those peppers. I always had them. It was great for the lineup. And how do you feel about 2022, Marco? How positive are you? It can only go up. <laughs> it can only get better. Like, honestly, like the last two years have been, have been something. Um, the 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 one thing that I hope for is that the way we've changed the way we're doing business right now, and I was having a conversation with this uh, about this with uh, a general manager from a uh, Toyota store not too long ago. But the way we've changed to we change managed to change the way we do business with not having inventory on the ground and uh, and you know kind of holding on to uh, prices and and you know the whole discounting the vehicle offer process does leave a bad taste in people's mouths. And as much as clients hate it, I think they're happier paying full price right now, which is what most dealerships are doing because they're, it, it gets rid of that stressful component of the, of the selling process. If we can only hang on to doing business the way we're doing it, being transparent and, and just providing people with great service, 
you know, it'll be, it'll be fantastic. Uh, it'll only get better from here. But uh, yeah, I mean, after the past two years, what we've been through and everything else, I mean, I, I, I don't want to put bad, uh, bad uh, vibes out there. Um, but I, I don't think, I don't want to jinx it, but I don't think it could get any worse than what we've already been through. So it, it's only, we can only look up right now. Terrific. So you don't want to put a little bit of bad juju in there, eh? <laughs> no. Definitely not. <laughs> I'm knocking wood right now. What's your opinion on 2022? Keith? Oh, sorry about that. Didn't hear you. Um, so it, I don't want to say it's bleak. and But this is what I can say. As far as a growth standpoint, I've sold roughly about 50 less cars year over year. However, my gross has been through the roof, and it, it, it's coming down to the negotiations of, okay, you want a discount on this vehicle, let's move on to the next. I have somebody else who's willing to pay full price. So if, if the artificial supply and demand is, is still high, then I think everything's going to work itself out. Are we selling less vehicles? Yes. However, with the market the way that it is, you have a lot of these dealers, they're putting addendums on these vehicles, five, $10,000 addendums. And I've even seen where Ford has uh, put out a statement saying they're not allowing Ford dealers to put addendums on these F-150 Lightnings. And the reason that I think that we're so successful is, is because everybody, Everybody in the area is trying to take advantage of the supply and demand, and they're putting addendums on these vehicles. And clients aren't they're, – they're not uneducated anymore. They know more about the vehicles than I do most of the time. They know the MSRP. They know the invoice, and they know if they're getting taken advantage of. And that's why I think we've been so successful is because of the transparency and – you know, it is what it is, but um, if you're able to get in to another market, so if you're able to capture clientele from, like in my situation, I, I'm in a small market. We have maybe uh, 10,000 people as far as our city population goes. You know, I have less than a million people in the state of West Virginia that I can actually sell to you know, 800 and some odd thousand. However, if I go outside my market, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and capture these clientele that local dealers aren't because they're, they're, for lack of better terms, you know, ticking everybody off, I'm going to do it. And as, as long as that demand is there, then I think everything's going to work itself out because of the gross. The gross is are absolutely through the roof and it's just because of honesty and for for everyone who is in the canadian market since we're not able to do that legally addendum means charging more is that correct that is absolutely correct so you have the maroni sticker uh on on a new vehicle that you know the the bible of the vehicle tells the options and and everything, and then you have what's called an addendum sticker. So the second, the second, second sticker. Yeah, that's the second sticker. So what I've seen dealerships do is, is they'll put, you know, environmental package stickers on, they'll charge for nitrogen, they'll charge for tint, but it's these extra added items. And they'll even do what's called a market adjustment. Just yeah. because I have the only vehicle in the area, I'm going to charge $7,500 more for it. And you know, clients see that. And that's the thing is, is, you know, if you're going to charge me $10,000 more than what that vehicle's worth, now whenever I go to trade that vehicle in and I'm $20,000 upside down, yep. the person that I'm thinking about is the dealer that put me in that situation and I will never deal with them again. Now, on that flip side, you have to do how many positive things to get a, a good review, but you do that one bad thing. I'm telling everybody in my family, everybody that I work with, everybody I go to, to church with, everybody I see in the grocery store, do not go to that dealer. Ironically, the Mulroney sticker that was created a long time ago now was created to prevent that practice. Was it created I remember when they used to put a sticker. Pricing. I remember yeah, Senator Mulroney used that 
Oh, always a, it's named after him. Yeah. Absolutely. No, they put used to put a sticker beside the Monroney label that looked like the Monroe Monroney label. Boy, that's a tongue tire. <laughs> um, and it used to put A D P. And it's got nothing to do with the company, the, the big ADP company. In little tiny print underneath, it said added dealer profit. <laughs> and it shy about it. Reading coming out right there. Yep. Uh, does the generation gap only apply to customers? Maybe we can start with Keith since you were just talking about uh, the second sticker. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely have to say that there there is a generational gap. I mean, especially with clientele. And, you know, I want to say it's around uh, maybe my biggest hurdle is the, the, the 65, the 70, the 80 year olds. Um, the boomers is a little bit older than the boomers, right? So the, the, the biggest, the biggest uh, uh, obstacle that I have with them is just physically getting them to understand the technology. Again, they're going from a, a people that was a 2009 that, you know, crank windows were still an option. Electronic stability control wasn't even on all the people. But, but no again, power but, steering. But, <laughs> You're, you're telling these people about adaptive cruise control, braking assist, lane keeping assist, and they just they don't understand it. So it you have to it slows your process down, and then you know you're you're we have uh, through Subaru and, and Hyundai we have Starlink and Blue Link, and it, it's just it's their versions of OnStar for lack of better terminology, but you're you're helping these clientele set up uh, set up their vehicle, and then you know they they don't know how to use their smartphone. So now you're having to teach them about their smartphone. So it takes a you know a, a half an hour to an hour process. Now you're two and a half hours, three hours deep into it. So would I say that there is is a generational gap? It, yes, without question. But if you can overcome and just be patient, uh, patient with them is, is the best thing I can describe. You will have a lifelong customer. They will send everybody to you. Oh, my goodness, he hooked up my Bluetooth. Oh, my goodness, he showed me how to use the paddle shifters. Oh, my goodness, he showed me what the automatic idle stop and go was. You will have a lifelong customer. And that's what I've been doing. I've just been setting up my pipeline. and. In West Virginia, um, if you're an outsider, it's, it's, it's a coal mine community. So, you know, to trust a new person is, is very hard around here. It's very community-based. So if, if you help people and your heart is in the right place, people see that and they want to work with you. And that's the reason why I'm so successful. Fantastic. Marco, what do you think? Generations in Toronto? Um, I think that, um, yeah, it doesn't just apply with clients. It applies with, uh, with, uh, with your coworkers, with your day-to-day, -day, with everything, really. Um, ultimately, you can't, like, if I, if I talk in my, call it millennial slang to my parents, they're not going to understand half of what I'm, uh, what I, what I'm telling. So I have to cater to their needs and, uh, <laughs> you know, talk, talk, talk a little differently. And just like the example I made of um, one of my old GMs telling me that I have to treat the guy who was, was 56 years old different than the guy that was 20 years old. Um, that goes with, with pretty much everything. But again, it's like, we're catering. I, I like to cater to the personality. It's just that what I modify might be the vocabulary that I'm using with them. Uh, might be, you know, what are the information that I'm that I'm uh, providing them with? So essentially, if I'm talking to um, to somebody who's my age, I can talk to them freely about technology, and they're gonna pretty much be up to date with what I'm telling them. Uh, versus with uh, my parents, I had to go to their house not long ago and install WhatsApp on their computer because they couldn't figure out how to do that. Which I I like I don't even have to think about that, right? or uh, updating their, their computer or wherever it is. But uh, yeah, so it's, it's kind of, it's a little bit with everybody, but 
you know, they've they've taught me stuff that uh, that that my generation doesn't understand, right? So uh, it, it goes back to um, uh, to to what we were talking about earlier. How uh, you know you want to surround yourself with people uh, from uh, from different generations, like Troy was saying, uh, because it it expands your uh, it expands your uh, your visibility, your your sight. Uh, to things that you cannot learn from the from the same generation that you surround yourself with. So I, I do that proactively. Like the people that I hang out with uh, or that I speak to are from many different generations. Um, yeah, and you and I talk every now and then and uh, and I appreciate the conversations we have because uh, the, suge- the book suggestions that you give me and things like that, I, uh, I, I follow and uh, and i appreciate and i wouldn't be able to get that from somebody of uh, my generation because uh, ultimately they're they're in tune with what i see every day and if you keep the same following the same path every single day you're never going to see other paths that are around you right so yeah sue did you want to comment on the older generation i just had one thought i sold a gentleman a car 15 years ago he was in his 80s he rode off his honda civic he wanted to buy a new Honda Civic, which happened to be a 2005, a new to him car. And I asked him, did you want a CD player or a cassette deck? Because his old car had a cassette deck in it. He goes, I don't know, these CDs are way, way too newfangled. I don't think I want that. So I had to get him a cassette deck from a wrecker because they didn't exist. And ironically, it was an auto reverse cassette deck. So he called me a couple of days after he picked up the car and he said, it's making this noise and then it's playing music. And I said, that, yeah, it's auto reverse. What's that? Well, it automatically flips the tape for you. Oh, I didn't know that was available. <laughs> you know, we talk, you talked about, um, you know, different people are more tech savvy and not. Um, in the last couple of years, the car, we sold a car to a guy who was 98. And I had to ask his son, who was in his 70s, if it was okay if his dad bought a new car. <laughs> but anyway, I asked him, I said, so what's your secret to staying so young? Because he was incredibly intelligent and very, very with it. And his answer brilliantly was buying new cars. God love him. Um, <laughs> so I, it really depends on the person. Uh, whether it be management, whether it be customers, whatever, just be aware of who you're working with and uh, appreciate them for who they are and what their knowledge and skill level is because people surprise us all the time. And I, and on that note, um, I'm blown away by the young people that I get to work with uh, at the um, business Automotive Business School of Canada. They are so knowledgeable and they care so much and they just are so interested in wanting to learn more and wanting to take this business to another level. And I'm so excited, really I am, for the future of our business because the people that I'm seeing in management are amazing. And uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm thrilled. (laughs) Fantastic. Well, Jeff, we're out of time. So any final comments from anybody? Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Some great, great information and uh, obviously a conversation, which is what we're all about. And um, we thank you all for taking the time and those that weren't official guests. And, of course, our lovely and fine sponsors. Thank you very much. And uh, let's let's move on and let's go with make things happen. Have a great week. I'm just playing our new exit trailer. Here we go. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye-bye, all. Thank you. See ya. Bye.